Hi guys, I'm Charles Brownstein from northerntransmissions.com. Thank you as always for checking out Records in My Life. This episode features Jake and John from Health. Let's see what they're digging. Hi, this is Jake. And this is John. From Health, and this is Records in My Life. Oh, on uh, northerntransmissions.com. Um, I guess record one I'm going to choose uh, Stooges Funhouse. The first album I ever bought with my own money, and the kid who, an older kid, a friend of mine who I really idolized, who got me into music. Uh, he got me into music. He sent me a Dead Kennedys tape in the mail, but he played me a bunch of records, and I really liked Stooges Funhouse. And he told me at the time that all critics in the world agreed that it was the greatest record ever made, and it was the Citizen Kane of albums. And there's a newer class of critics who disagree, and they said it was Sonic Youth's Jay Dream Nation. And he gave me a tape of that too. So, and I didn't like that at first. So he was just fucking with you. No, he believed that. Oh. I don't know where the fuck he heard that. <laughs> so um, he believed it. It was honest. Not that I don't think it's a great album. I'm just saying. No. So, uh, so like I never liked music until really cared about music until he he, he gave me his Dead Kennedys tape and I loved it and I started wanting to get any more bands. And he'd feed me records and so uh, when I had money, I was like, I got to get that Stooges record. It's the greatest record ever made. So uh, my mom took me to the record store and we bought it and I was so excited. I went home. And I put it on, I'm like, this is the best thing ever. I love it. I listen to it every day after school. It's the only CD I had for a while until I started buying more CDs. And in my head, I was like, this is the greatest record ever made. I love it. I'm so cool. I'm so fucking smart. Like, this, this is it. And I didn't know it wasn't considered the greatest record ever made until I was like 18 or something. And I was like, how come this isn't on any best of list? This is no one even fucking considers this a big deal. So it really fucking warped my mind. And it also made me kind of a dick from the very beginning because I was like I didn't care about music previously and I'm like I like music and from the beginning I, I already got the best. greatest record yeah I got the greatest record I have the best music taste around and then so like <laughs> when all this shit was coming out when I was in school I'm like I hate all this crap I listen to the real stuff excuse me I already have the best record and it's really good and now I like the other best record Daydream Nation so like my whole my whole sense of itself was warped in reference to the band I had sort of an epiphany thing this is bef- much before the band was when I first got into Crass and um, kind of realized that a band could be aesthetically more about sounds than actually notes or musicality. Like, that they had a rhythm guitar player that fucking just, like, put his hand over the bridge and just played distortion on every song on Feeding of the 5,000. And that was just, like, he was the, the rhythm guitar player. That was kind of mind-blowing to me, that you could have something where it's just like, all right, like, we're not going to, like learn how to play this shit we're just gonna always make music that is so aggressive like that's the message the music and so that was very freeing that i could just listen to music that was essentially non-musical was like actually a very big musical epiphany for me uh when i uh first met uh, met uh jake and we started doing doing this stuff i was really excited about like a lot of new york bands and a lot of uh, wacky shit and and you know, we've had a few practices and it wasn't really coming together or it was weird, we all had disagreements and I was like, well, I really want to do this cool shit and I played them the this, this, uh, X Model Zoo Psychology and immediately everyone responded to it and we're like, whoa, this is this is fucking cool. It's kind of a deep cut. I don't know if you guys know that record. Yeah, it's, it's not like it was amazing a big, record. Big, big record. And then we got to see them live too and they were, we actually had to play a show with them. We had to open for them uh, when... Uh, um, Il Corral. Il Corral. It was, like a, it was a noise warehouse. And in one of our, it's a pretty early show and it, they were awesome so uh that was like it was just really important so touchdown for the band so i guess i'm going to jump back to a record for me um it's actually also pertains to the band i started listening to it before but um it was uh music for 18 musicians which is a it's you know a modern composer i do you say steve reich or steve reich you always hear it both i ways. say reich but I I mean, reich makes sense to me because it's like a german word so steve reich um so I got really obsessed with his music, essentially the idea of process music, that you would dictate what you were going to write a song about or how you would write it before you even started. So it's like, and we tried to do in a much more rudimentary form um, than, than Steve Reich did, where that music was extremely emotional for me, and I think it really changed film scores. And even when I listen to it now, it sounds like electronic music being performed acoustically with woodwinds and mallet instruments and and controlled percussive voices that's mind-blowing we couldn't do that that was very inspiring so you know we take something and go all right well we're gonna write a song that's totally fucking symmetrical so if you like looked at it like the amount of things that happened and all the chordal changes it's the same from the beginning the same as the as, as from the end 
which is the idea of process music, which is something that Steve Reich was like a godfather of, where John Cage obviously started that um, earlier, but you know, that you could write a song from a way that was not traditional. Like, you don't have to think about it in terms of, hey man, I got this riff, like why don't you put a little walking bass line over it and I'll fucking drink some beers and see if we can write some cool lyrics about fuck it. Like, it doesn't have to be like that. <laughs> so we kind of were looking at that in a way that, taking stuff like X Models, atonal, shit like Stockhausen 12 tone music where you're just inserting different things and then um, the idea of writing songs based on a precept not a, a riff or a melody it's a really weird <laughs> I guess all the records I really should not pick this one but I really love the first Andrew WK album I Get Wet and when I <laughs> but when I when I first uh, heard it I was like this is terrible music you know like what why why and it was the first time in my life and then my buddy's like no man it's cool because it's retarded <laughs> <laughs> and like it was the first time this is like you know early 2000s that irony as a concept of like something that you could like that that could even be possible and i was like it was like hey what? The fuck? And it was like culture has taken the ball and run with it. From yeah, it's true. But it, you know, this is you know the young, young, very young boy. It's just like a, it was a new thing, and it was like, it, you know, and uh, and I really like, I ended up really loving the record. And we listened to it a lot, but it was like this thing. Like, no, it's irony. It's like, no, you're gonna dress like this. You're gonna dress stupid. You're gonna wear all that lame thing because it's cool because it's lame. And I'm like, what? And it was this like really new well, thing for me. It's like when you're a kid and you don't like you don't watch tongue-in-cheek bad movies no, you, you, you want to watch at, good movies it's like, I don't have yeah. time for this shit to yeah. you know but then you like it becomes like this whole and yeah. you can appreciate the level of it being amazing and it, you know it's a step well he was self-aware too of he course was. And but he's also, it's also really great and, and, and I really like it but, uh, but there's also like there's all kinds of st that, that kind of opened the door for all these weird things it's like nah you can like this because this is it's, it's cheesy and purple like, the song's about fire in the Taco Bell that's funny <laughs> you know like stuff like that um, <laughs> it, it was a new thing and it you know it, it, it was uh, I think maybe for the time or at least it was for me don't feel bad about it yeah. say what you feel yeah it's 2000 odds man Okay, um, I wanted to do Shoo Shoo Fabulous Muscles. Um, that record is incredible. And I think for us especially, uh, during the time that we were really kind of starting to tour on like a DIY level, like booking our own shows, um, we were just blown away by how original. I mean, that record came out when I was, before we started the band. It came out like in 2003, I think. Um, and I remember just being blown away by it then. And we just became huge fans of his, and I just remember spending so many tours listening to it, and us all marveling. We were like, "There's like no antecedent, nor like it's like what? There's no genre. Like I understand that there's certain touchstones that he would have been influenced by, but like it doesn't sound like any other band. And the production was always incredible, and it's like it's so emotional and over the top that you'd think it would be cross. It does for some people. For some people, jazz alarm goes off, and they're like, it's too emotional. For us, it just blew us away. So that's like one of my, I fanboyed out on him super hard because he lives in LA now. And uh, that's, I think, a damn near perfect record. So I wanted, wanted to do that one. That one's a big one for the band.